Welcome to Digital Asset News to get top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today we've got a lot of stuff to go over, so let's jump right in. Top New York regulator calls crypto an important potential alternative, i.e. a game changer, to the current financial system. This is a long time coming, and what this person says kind of blew my mind. Also, why a lack of leverage could keep Bitcoin and stocks climbing despite the sell-off. This is one of the big questions. If the traditional markets are at the tank, what's going to happen to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? And as we're going to point out, it's going to actually, it's going to go the opposite way. Also, the sushi swap creator who did a exit scam of $14 million admits he effed up and actually gave all the money back. And this is one of those shining lights in a very dark sea of what's going on with DeFi. And I have to tip my hat to this guy or gal who did this. And lastly, European crypto exchange hacked for a paltry 5.4 million of Bitcoin, which will lead us into question of the day. We'll do that at the very end, but let's take a look at what's going on with the market. So today is 9-11. And it's a very somber day in the United States and across the world. So um, I can just tell you, I can remember, I can remember waking up today, you know, all those years ago, 19 years ago, and uh, just watching the news in total utter disbelief. I couldn't believe it happened. So it was a pretty dark day. Hopefully, we never forget what happened. All right, moving on. So what do we have today? So Bitcoin up 0.1. So not really doing too much. It's kind of teetering at uh, 10.3. Ethereum, hey, 367, not too bad. Only down 4% for the week. Tether's Tether and XRP is XRP. <laughs> Chainlink down 1% uh, to 1242, so not too shabby. And everything across the board isn't too fantastic except for Crypto.com. And the reason Crypto.com is up, I believe, is because they're getting into the DeFi space with a liquidity protocol for their CRO token. So it's an interesting development. Let's see how it works out. Also, Tron is up 2.6%. Um, congratulations to all the Tron holders. Neo up 10%. I have no idea why. No idea. If, no, if someone knows why my Neo has a, a legitimate reason to jump 10%, let me know in the comment section because I don't get it. Urine Finance uh, jumped all the way back from like 21,000 now to 33,693 per token. So amazing. And UMA, another one of the DeFi darlings at 1729. So not too bad. And that's pretty much it except for synthetics, also a DeFi token up 10% and 13% for ontology. Again, that must be a Neo ontology, um, some type of connection there. So uh, let me know what, what that is in the comment section. Let's get into today's top story. So first up, New York regulator calls crypto an important potential alternative to the current financial system. And this is one of those things that would have blown my mind in 2017. If a regulator from New New York and all their bit license shenanigans comes out and says, you know what? Cryptocurrency is a pretty good thing. We should really look into that. I would have lost my marbles, but here we are today. So this is actually Linda Lacewell, a New York Department of Financial Services superintendent, considers cryptocurrency a top-notch innovation. She talked about the importance for regulators to stand back, allowing entrepreneurs to lead innovations, especially in the crypto industry. I could not agree more. What a breath of fresh air. This person, Linda, must be an entrepreneur herself because there is no innovation coming by way of the banks. The banks should just step out of the way. The OCC said the exact same thing and just let innovation take its course. And that's all they got to do. Just get out of your own way and let us do all the good stuff. And you guys can just go back in the shadows. And it's a pretty lengthy uh, article. I'm just going to read this la this paragraph, which kind of blew my mind. And one sentence in particular. Linda states, so I think that crypto is very important as an innovation and as a potential alternative to some aspects of the financial system some aspects. The reason I like it is that it's organic, it's been developed, and over time it has become more sophisticated. And I remember in 2017, we thought that the, the crypto market was going to go to the moon, but it wasn't so because we needed to lay all the track and get to where we are today. And that's why you got somebody who in, in New York as a regulator saying, you know what, it's grown over time and it's more sophisticated and we see the use cases. Further, she states, when you have the fidelities of the world, coming in, looking for some type of bit license from us, you know that things have really changed. We can't say it's on the fringe anymore. And that is exactly the main point. If you take a look at Fidelity with its 8 trillion assets under management, and they're telling these regulators going, look, we need a bit license because we really need to get into cryptocurrency digital assets. So like, hmm, that's interesting. You guys got a lot of money to uh, throw around. So maybe there's something to it. And also Ameritrade did the same thing. And we also have 
our darlings, which is Grayscale with their 2.2 billion assets. Actually, now it's like 4.3. This is a uh, report from Q1 of 2020, and they talked about how, hey, the majority of our investments, 88%, came from institutional investors dominated by hedge funds. And that was the first quarter. So this one coming up, I mean, it's just, it's going bananas. Also, you have the Paul Tudor Jones, which Paul Tudor Jones, if you don't know, is one of those investment legends who really crushed it in the 80s, early 90s. And he came out and said, look, uh, as of May 8th, he states, I'm going to put 2% of total investments into Bitcoin futures, which people say, well, Bitcoin futures, what is that? It doesn't matter. The guy just said his name with Bitcoin. That's all people really really have comprehended so far and that's good for our space and then lastly we say we see somebody like microstrategy which is a open analytics platform and you know, data analytics and crunch the numbers and they and their ceo came up and said look uh we just bought twenty one thousand bitcoin in august and uh they now own 0.1 percent of all bitcoin the ceo stated look bitcoin is digital gold harder stronger faster and smarter than any money that has preceded it it wasn't what he said, but it, he just didn't beat around the bush. And these are the types of things, especially this is a pretty good company. Uh, they probably took a lot of crunching of numbers and say, you know what looks pretty good? Bitcoin and cryptocurrency digital assets. Let's get into that. So when we start to talk about these things that, you know, the uh, institutions are coming and there's changes afoot, that is proof of what we want to see. So let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on. Next up, why lack of leverage keep Bitcoin and stocks climbing despite the sell-off? So this is a big question that, that comes about because we've seen massive growth in the S&P 500, the traditional market, NASDAQ, and everything else because it's a bubble. Let's just call a spade a spade. It's a bubble. The Fed is in there, and they are propping everything up. So the question then becomes, well, what happens when the Fed goes, hey, sorry, we can't print any more money. We just ran out of ink. They won't say that, but I mean, at some point they're going to actually stop uh, quantitative easing. So what's going to happen to stocks? Well, it's going to pop. And then we're going to see a lot of people going, hey, what do we do now? I believe that the traditional market players that are in cryptocurrency right now, there will be a, a slight sell off. But the strong hands like you and me right now, we're going to reap the benefits massively. And I've always said this. What is going to propel the cryptocurrency digital asset space is uncertainty. And when we've got things like the presidential election, this coronavirus come breathing down our neck and a lack of a vaccine, what we're going to see is when this bubble pops, I'm like, what? wait, where do we put our money? What do we do? Well, we'll take it out of the stock market and guess what we could do? Maybe put it into, I don't know, uh, gold, gold silver and this thing called bitcoin which is digital gold and what's all the other cryptocurrencies oh they're all going up what's this DeFi thing maybe that's a big thing to get into getting ahead of myself sorry this is what the article states the sell-off taking pause may only be emboldening bulls and further encouraging them to buy the dip with confidence and until more leverage is added to the market analysts say more upside is likely before the bubble burst. And sure, we're going to see uh, more increase in the traditional market before it actually just blows out. But this is what's in interesting. The sell-off, which just recently happened, S&P took a dip, in the six top tech stocks combined was equal to or greater than five Bitcoin networks and market caps worth of value. Can you imagine that? 200 something billion or 160, whatever, 180 billion or something like that. Uh, five times, five X of what that is. And there's just these tech companies. I mean, not just the tech companies, but I mean, Facebook, really? Come on, come on. And you have the ongoing correlation between crypto and the stock market had previously kept the asset classes climbing side by side. When sentiment turned recently, both classes fell again together. And according to Andrea Cicioni, head of strategy at investment research firm TS Lombard, points to this chart right here. Now we can see that it does look incredibly similar. Let's just be honest, right? Bitcoin here, NASDAQ there, climbing, dipping, diving, dodge, dip, dip, duck, dodge, and dive. But here's the whole crux of it, uncoupling. So Cicioni claims that unlike other peaks in price, there's a distinct lack of leverage in the market that has prevented a trigger in more downside. He states, after such a severe drop, weak hands, have already been shaken out and now with support holding both bitcoin and stock market bulls maybe we're getting both their footing and confidence for another push higher further growth in the stock market could as ccony warns could reflate the tech stock bubble and keep valuations climbing but that doesn't change the fact that there's still a bubble and it's going to blow up and lastly what could separate the two classes once and for all 
confirming a $10,000 as support. This is for Bitcoin. And a triangle breakout could cause serious FOMO on crypto beyond what's going on in stocks. The allure of prices soaring while stocks potentially start to stagnate or suffer could further fuel Bitcoin's rise from the inflow of stock capital. So here's what's going on. You can see, and we just took a look at that recently. When we took a look at uh, Coin Market Cap, or not, excuse me, Coin Gecko, and it's just it. If it has gone below ten thousand, it's been for a very short amount of time, ninety nine eighty, ninety nine uh, sixty two, or somewhere in there. But it's always hit that ten thousand and bounced right back up. If they can keep that level, it will signal to all the different investors out there, like, look, here is our bottom line, ten thousand, and we can only go up or oh, we can only go up from here. Our all-time high was almost 20,000. This just happened three years ago. We already had our halving. We've laid a lot of track. There's a lot of new innovation in the space. We are ready for prime time. And we've got a lot of institutional players who have come into the space and go, we want Bitcoin. So again, I'm just going to reiterate what I said in the beginning. What will push the crypto market to higher highs is uncertainty and speculation. And with the presidential election coming up, no vaccine, and we got a plunging GDP for all not just America, but for nations across the globe, we're going to see a lot of uncertainty. And what that's going to do is push people into cryptocurrency assets as a safe haven. Let's move on. Next up, I just saw this and I had to I had to put it in. And it was an I effed up sushi swap creator, Chef Nomi returns 14 million in developer funds. When I first heard about this story, if you don't know, Sushi Swap, it's a DeFi platform, and they were able to uh, give everybody their governance coin, which is Sushi, in exchange for borrowing or lending cryptocurrency. And it was quite a lucrative offer. The problem was, is that this guy said, hey, I'm taking all that money. Thanks a lot. I'm out of here. And uh, what he did, which is unprecedented, he came back and said, you know what? What did he say right here? Ah, this one right here. To everyone, I effed up, and I'm sorry. And he gave the money back. So... I was critical of this project. I was down on it. But if you, this is one of those those shining beacons of lights in a very turbulent dark sea. And I like to see. I actually, I don't like. I'd love to see these types of stories. So uh, someone came back and said, "Hey, you know what? Made a mistake. Raise your hand." And this is what we should be doing, just as people in general. When you screw up, you say, "Hey, I messed up." I mean, I do it all the time. Ask my wife. Uh, so, like, th this type of story is fantastic. I'm not going to delve too, too much into it. Just take it for what it is. Guy said, hey, I shouldn't have done that, and I'm going to return the money, and let's make this thing great. Let's make let's make sushi great again. And uh, that's essentially what happened. So um, what, you, what are your thoughts on this? Let me know. Let's move on to our last story. Last up, European crypto exchange hack for $5 million in Bitcoin. What a bummer. Eaterbase. Uh, a Slavic crypto exchange revealed Thursday that it had been hacked for $5 million. Cyber criminals broke into six hot wallets containing Bitcoin, Ethereum, Algo, Ripple, Tezos, and Tron. Oh, no, not Tron. Stealing everything it said. So I want to say one thing. Uh, I get emails constantly from different exchanges all over the world that want me to advertise on, on the channel. I just say no because um, I just can't do it. I, I just can't do it. I don't know. I mean, they don't have a track record. They're not really proven. There's a lot of risk, but there's a lot of reward on that, you know, uh, but I just won't do it. And this is the reason why, because of stuff like this. Anyhow, it states here, hot wallets are active digital asset accounts connected to the internet. Eaterbase used these wallets to facilitate day-to-day -day act trading activities on its platform. And this is not just them. This is hot wallets are across all different types of exchanges. So it's all about the security measures that they have in place. I need to get a security expert on the channel and talk about how they, how like a Coinbase doesn't get hacked, but Eaterbase does. That'd be interesting. According to a series of messages posted on its Telegram channel, Eaterbase detected the hack. And this is what sucks but was powerless to stop it. Imagine watching 5 million just snap out of existence like Thanos and it just goes away and that's it. You, and, you, and you can't do anything. You're like, oh, there it goes. That would be awful. Eventually, the company tracked the crypto assets as it left its coffers. A large part of the stolen money ended up at Binance, who will be global and hit BTC. It claimed on Twitter, Eaterbase has now contacted these exchanges requesting that the funds be frozen. And I will do a follow up to this story if this actually happens. And uh, because there's there is two different um, segments of people. One one group is like, you know what? It's cryptocurrency digital assets. So if that happened too bad, so sad. Sorry, Charlie, you lost your money. 
There's another part that says, you know what, we have the power and ability to do this. Let's freeze these assets. And this has happened. This is the main reason why Ethereum and Ethereum Classic split uh, because of hacks and uh, trying to rewind what was already done. To me, it's not for me to say. It's not for me to 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 put this in, but I would I'm curious to see what is going to happen with this. I'm very curious, actually. Lastly, it states in July, another European crypto exchange, Casha lost 336 Bitcoin worth 3 million. And then also last year, Japan, uh, Japan's Bitpoint, damn, they lost 32 million. And a few months later, South Korean platform Upbit uh, lost 52 million. Uh, Zaif, another Japanese exchange, was attacked for 60 million in 2018. So this is some of those problems I talk about with exchanges and hot wallets. And the question then comes up is like, well, should I just hold everything into my uh, Nano Ledger, which is a cold wallet? Should I put it someplace else? And this is actually a complex uh, answer. And I'm going to do that right now in Q of the Day. So let's jump in the office. All right, everybody, and welcome back to the office. Uh, the Q of the Day is a pretty... It's an interesting question, uh, but really what it is, it is a question that is one of the uh, basics of basics that we should be covering, and not just here, but we should be covering this a lot more. So the question is, uh, this is from Kat, she says, hey Dan, can you explain why we should transfer our Bitcoin and crypto to a ledger, which is a pretty good question, right? Why would we have to you know, transfer everything, especially when we're used to banks doing everything for us? Uh, Cat states, why can't we just keep it on the exchange? Is that unsafe? It seems easier, like a bank. What if we lost our passwords phrase? Is all lost? Isn't it easier for a company to retrieve a password? Is it a must, another gadget in my home? What a pain. So this is a great question. And that is why we included the last article where we talked about the, the different exchanges that are getting hacked. And this isn't just happened like uh, recently. This isn't like a uh, a non-normal occurrence. Over the years, uh, there has been many different exchanges that have been hacked. And uh, one of those, one of the biggest ones, was Mt. Gox. And it was like around 300 million, 400 million, somewhere around there. Uh, correct me in the comments section. I'm sure uh, you people know uh, the exact numbers. But it's one of those things where if we have a, a hot wallet, uh, as they call it, like we, we talked about in the last uh, article, uh, it's a much easier for these hackers to get in there. And it's just sitting there right for the taking. So the easiest way is to uh, shift everything over onto a nano ledger, which is called cold storage, uh, because it, there's no access to, you know, from the internet. So hackers can't get in there uh, unless they have a quantum computer, which uh, that might happen in 20 years, who knows, or two or five, if you're, you know, a conspiracy theorist, or maybe it's even here right now, who knows. But uh, the whole, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, the whole thing is, is that if you want to be completely safe and then really get into it and become your own bank, then you should really look towards a nano ledger. And this is one of the things that uh, it uh, frightened me in the beginning, uh, but I also appreciate it now more so as I've gotten to realize just how dirty and ugly the banks are. Look, uh, the banks have been screwing us for years and they were responsible for that 2008 financial crash. And that's essentially why uh, Bitcoin was created in the first place. So when we start to talk about, you know, be your own bank, you can be your own bank. You don't have to deal with those, you know, all the different banks and all their crappy um, interest rates that are just awful, all their fractional reserve lending and all the different nonsense that they have to, you know, go through and jump to the hoops just to put your money somewhere. So why even go through that, that process? Just do a little bit more work and you can become your own bank. So I, I want to go over this question again just to make sure that you know I answered everything in detail. So um, why can't we keep on the exchanges? Okay, we answered that. Uh, actually, no, I didn't answer that. There's a little caveat. And the caveat is, is that you should definitely take everything off of the exchanges and put in your nano if you want to be 100% secure. However, uh, in my exit strategy, I talk about leaving a portion of your crypto on the exchange as things start to go up and starts to um, get into that bull run. See, the problem with, with bull runs, and this is more of an advanced strategy, but the problem with the bull runs is that once prices start to climb, there's a weird mentality that goes on. Um, and that mentality is, well, if it just 10x, then you know tomorrow or next week or a month, it might 100x. So I don't really want to sell anything right now. And that's the problem with taking profits. However, if you leave a little bit on the exchange, and I'm not saying 100%, I'm saying a little percent. 
10%, 15%, and uh, go ahead and, and check out the uh, uh, bull run strategies uh, or exit plans that I have for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and XRP. And if you're able to put things on the exchange, uh, then it can trigger automatically, and we can set up these orders that just trigger without you having to do anything, and you can take profits, and you don't have to deal with the emotional roller coaster of actually selling your cryptocurrency. So that is one of the things I, I, I recommend, and it's one of those caveats I talk about. Also, um, another caveat is this, is if <clears throat> you want to gain interest on your cryptocurrency, um, you're not going to leave it in your nano ledger because you can stake it. You can put it onto other different platforms such as Voyager, such as Celsius, such as uh, BlockFi, uh, even Crypto.com. Uh, they have an interest if you leave your cryptocurrency on their exchanges. So the problem with that is, of course, you are not in control of your cryptocurrency. However, you're... Um, resigning that to these exchanges, to these entities, so they can pay you uh, an interest. So that's just one of those things that, to think about. So for me, like when I talk about these things, like when I first got into cryptocurrency, it was like, you need to take 100% of your cryptocurrency and get it off the exchanges because if it's not your keys, it is not your crypto. And uh, that was the model that we've been living with for quite a long time. But now as things have changed a little bit, as time has gone on, there is a little bit more of a leeway in that whole thinking. Now, again, you can do whatever you want to. If you want to put everything on a nano ledger, put everything on a nano ledger. It's the safest that you will ever have. And uh, it won't, I mean, it hasn't been hacked uh, yet. So we'll see what happens. But uh, you can do that. You can do what I do, which is to leave some of the exchanges for the bull run. Also put uh, part of your portfolio into a type of uh, platform that will pay you interest for doing absolutely nothing, which is way more than the, the shoddy banks that are out there. So uh, it's just up to you. Me personally, I have 25% of my entire portfolio in Celsius Network right now. In Celsius, I have 25% of all my cryptocurrency because I trust it. And uh, trust is a currency that you can't buy. And um, I believe in Alex Mashinsky and what he's got going on over there. Now that there are other platforms, I could definitely do it. But for right now, 25%, that's where it is. The rest, Nano Ledger, and a little bit uh, on the exchanges right now for when the bull run actually, or the parabolic bull run actually happens. So hopefully that answers the question a little bit more thoroughly. Um, and then Kat states, is that unsafe? It's unsafe. <laughs> anyway, look at it, it's unsafe. It seems easier like a bank. And this is one of those things that, We've all dealt with this for the longest of times, which is just to trust the bank, just to put money into the bank, and it's, it's right there, FDIC insured, $250,000, so it's not like a big deal. And then, of course, if you do any kind of transfer or something like that, it's the response of the bank to you know actually pay you back if something screws up or if they get robbed or whatever else. Once we give up that power to the bank and we freely gave this away, once we do that or once we did that, we are essentially bending the knee to the big banks and allow them to do whatever they want to do with our money. And we have to jump through all the hoops to you know, get a bank account, to use our own money, to transfer our own money, um, and to, you know, just to be able to say, hey, you know, I have a net worth somewhere, which is in some bank, which they're kind of screwing me anyhow because you know, they're taking all this and they're, they're loaning it all out. And uh, you know, whatever. Whatever they want to do because I have no recourse. Well, now you do. You have a recourse, which is cryptocurrency digital assets, and you can put you know, part of your, at least part of your, of your money into a different type of asset class. And uh, you can give you know, one of these fingers to the banks. <laughs> so that's it. And then the next one is, what if we lost our password phrase? So first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct you, if you haven't watched my Nano Ledger video yet, it goes over what are private keys, what are public keys, what is a hot wallet, what is a cold wallet, what is everything that you need to know as far as a nano ledger and just everything that I, I just talked about. So, and then password phrases or mnemonic phrases or however you want to, uh, people use different terms. So the thing is, this is one of the aspects of being your own bank. If you lose your passphrase and then you lose your nano ledger, there is no recourse. That's it. So. 
there's different um, products that, that you can uh, buy out there. One is the Stonebook or shieldfolio.com. I'm gonna link that in the uh, description. They were sold out uh, for, for quite some time. And it's just a, it's just a book that is uh, very hard. It's not indestructible. Uh, it's pretty much waterproof. It's not fireproof. Uh, it's smudge proof. It's time proof. It's, uh, I mean, but whatever you write in there is, is going to last a heck of a lot longer than if you write on a piece of paper. So um, if you're looking at something like that, I'll link in the description. But yeah, if the password phrase goes away, then that's it. I believe that there's going to be a bigger market for password phrases and storage and everything like that. I've seen different products where it's actually in steel. Uh, people actually etch it into steel, so that's indestructible. I mean, it's, unless it's like a, you know, super hot or something like that. But uh, the best thing that I found that is mo the most practical and the most uh, uh, price relevant would be that Shield Folio or Stonebook. And uh, I have one myself and I have all my passphrases in there and it's fantastic and uh, it's portable. So what are you gonna do? And then uh, the last thing it says here is, isn't it easier for a company to retrieve a password? Oh, you better believe it. Super easy, right? If And one of the whole big issue problems that uh, these banks usually have, not a problem, but um, they have a whole service center for this, is just pat people losing their passwords. So it's, and they're like, hey, no problem. We'll have tons of people on staff to help you get into your account as long as you keep feeding us the money so we can do what we want to do and we can kind of rake you over the coals. <laughs> and that's how it is. So uh, it's super easy for them just to, you know, retrieve the password. Sure, no problem. Come back to us. Come back to us. Coddle us. No big deal. You're safe right here. Nobody has to go away. Just keep putting your money in here and don't look at what's happening behind the curtain. So that's it. So hopefully I answered that question for, for Kat. I wanted to really go into detail. These are some of the things that, uh, especially as new people come in, we need to teach them. And that's why I am working diligently to get my free website up, which will have all the different information out there as far as like what cryptocurrency digital assets are, uh, how to do certain things, how to you know transfer your money, how to uh, do all the, the things we just talked about right now in a simple to use format. Uh, which has like like a Q&A section and all these different things. So I'll definitely get that uh, hopefully in the next month or so. So that's it. So uh, hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, let's jump back. All right, that's it. So thanks for sticking around with me to the end. I really appreciate it. If you like those types of videos, I mean, two ones going to pop up on your left and right. Not sure because YouTube does all that. And uh, that's it for today. So check those videos out when you've got time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for sticking with me. And I'll see you on the next one.